Welcome back. The issue of power generation has remained a big challenge for authorities. Recent findings show that power generation has again dropped by about 1,600 megawatts. And this has made power distribution more challenging than it has been these last couple of months. Joining me, uh, what are the generating com companies not doing well and how can the nation get out of these fluctuations? Joining me now to discuss this is energy expert and managing director of CCS Technologies Limited, engineer Arthur Usiabu. Thank you so much for joining us on the News at 10. Thank you very much. Well, we've talked about this before, um, how much we're distributing, how much we're generating. What's the exact figure that we have dropped to? Well, in the last um, five days, we had some issues with um, gas and uh, the generation. We lost about 2,000 megawatts. But um, in the last three days, there has been some improvement. I think uh, since uh, yesterday and today, we are hovering around uh, 4,200 megawatts. Wow. But were you surprised at the drop in power? I mean, we're still talking about gas. We're still, you know, I mean, it just sounds like we're having recurring problems all the time. Yeah, it's so sad that um, after so many years that um, the Electricity Reform Act of 2005 came into uh, stream. We are still talking, talking about challenges. Mm. Challenges in the area of gas supply to generating stations, challenges in the area of pricing, challenges also in um, uh, metering consumers. And um, one would expect that they uh, haven't put in so much money in the uh, electricity subsector for now we should be having some dividend. Uh, it looks as if we are still looking at this problem from one angle. If we have been putting all our efforts in one direction, and it's very clear that we are not making any inroads. So what we need to start looking at now is to think the unusual way, to be able to take this country out of this darkness. Mm -hmm. And that is what we need to do. Uh, I would like uh, those who are saddled with the responsibility of putting this policy in place to critically look at the embedded power option. That is the only way we can take this country out of this trouble. If you, if you look at Ikeja Electric, for example, there is nothing wrong in uh, the Jenkos thinking about putting in package distribution stations so that we can augment what we have from the grids. Now, the grids is comatose, generation we're having problem, distribution is sick, and this problem is continuing. It seems we don't even have a solution to all this problem. Yeah, you didn't even mention the estimated billing, which seems to have continued. A lot of Nigerians have been complaining recently. Uh, could, does that mean that perhaps the 45% increase in tariff may have taken um, effect without us knowing? Yes, if you look at uh, February bill, that is already on the pipeline. And it has taken effect, even if we know that um, the, the, the Senate has already called the NRC to order to say this is not right, this is not the way to go. We said this before that first thing first, we, we don't have this power and we are thinking about increasing tariff. That is not where we should go now. We need to solve this problem, ensure that we have power by looking at embedded option, as I said. Now, there is uh, a company within Lagos that is even having a whopping 30 megawatts of electricity. And, and, and the Jenkos are not taking advantage of this. So this is the only way we can go. Because we cannot be talking about electricity issues for the past 10 years. And we seem to have not, made, we've not been able to make any uh, improvement. For so many years now, we've been hovering around 4,000 megawatts. When we got to 5,000, we all shouted Uhuru. But now, we went back as low as about 2,000 plus. But you've, you've done all the research, so what's the shortcut here to get into where we're going? Because if you, if you have to mention all the things that you're talking about, yeah. it's going to take some time. So what's the, what's the quickest way to get there? I mean, at least to have some relief and have at least 17 hours of power a day. It is possible, Amarachi. We just need to do what is right. And I'll give you a very simple example. If you look at Lagos Metropolis today, you see street lights coming up everywhere. Mm -hmm. These are off-grid. Something is happening we should adopt the same approach to ensure that for each cluster we provide the embedded option, generate this power, distribute it so that 
a coal distribution zone, for example, a Kedja distribution, uh, I mean, a Kedja electric, for example, mm -hmm. can have this uh, uh, power available from the embedded option so that we can solve this problem once, or, once and for all. But if we keep on trusting that we are going to generate power from maybe uh, somewhere like Papalanto and we are piping gas all the way from Niger Delta to this end, it's going to give us a lot of uh, problems. So the embedded option is the only way we can go. Package generating stations are possible, mm -hmm. which we can do in about three, four months. And we can change this phase of continuous problem with electricity generation in this and country. Let's, let's hope the appropriate authorities are listening and are taking notes. Thank you so much, Mr. Engineer Arthur Osiabu, for joining Thank us. Thank you so much, Amarachi, for having me. Now to security, Nigerians need to be patient in dealing with the Boko Haram insurgency. That's according to the former chief of defense to the UK government, Lord David Richards. As citing situations in Afghanistan and Pakistan, Lord Richards is confident that no matter how long it takes, the Boko Haram insurgency will be quelled. Well, um, first of all, militarily, be under no illusion, I, I've done a bit of this sort of thing, um, it's never easy. It looks to the untrained eye as pretty straightforward, but it's never the case. So what um, you're confronting in, in Boko Haram is challenging but they are most uh, certainly defeatable. Um, and I think one has to be a bit patient. One has to, in the case of uh, many armies, reorientate to fight a different type of war. I mean, do you know it took 30 years for the British Army to defeat the IRA in Ireland? Um, it's taken um, 15 years in Afghanistan to do where we, to get where we've got to today. And many people, and I would be one and say, it's unfinished business. So. So um, I think it would be wrong to think that in these five to six years that one you have been grappling uh, with Baker Haram that it's suddenly going to be sold. It will take time. I think you have, can have confidence you will win this battle um, and I'm for one convinced that uh, more uh, international support is needed uh, to help you do that, particularly on the logistics side, um, at the higher levels, air, aviation, intelligence gathering while the West and other allies of yours are helping, they can do more. Lord David Richards. Now, Lokoja lies at the confluence of the Niger and Benue rivers and is the capital of Kogi State. It's also a trade center with respect to its agricultural products. However, the city appears to be faced with environmental challenges as waste items are not properly disposed. Our community report tonight examines the impact this situation has had on the state's social economic sector. Now, Lokoja, the capital of Kogi State, in Nigeria's north central region, is about two hours' drive from the nation's seat of power, Abuja. Coming into the city, what stares you in the face is a sight of piles and piles of refuse littering every corner of major streets and roads. A state that once hosted Lord Lugard, former Governor General of Nigeria, with all its historical sites, has an environmental challenge. The drains are clogged with refuse. A sore sight, according to residents. If you look at this refuse here, all there are hundreds of them here littered everywhere. Since the immediate past administration took over four years, it has been worse. If you look at the, the, the Ministry of Environment and Sanitation themselves, it, there are times where their equipment will break down. When we find out, they said their equipment, they have only one disposable vehicle. And how can you have one disposable vehicle when you are supposed to have options. I knew the pains we have gone through. And even though the dirty on ground is supposed to be packed, even though we are on a strike, it doesn't mean they should not uh, organize uh, some tipper to come and pack all those dirty. It can cause hazard to the human uh, living. This situation has raised concern. 
This group of professionals under the aegis of Project Kogi First have taken the bull by the horns to clean up the city. It's not everything that the government can do on its own. Coming out here to show support or carry out responsibilities that we can actually do to ourselves. We won't be putting too much burden. If we had leave this for the government to be doing, cleaning our environment, then the government will start channeling our limited resources towards taking care of this thing, things that we can actually do by ourselves. We are going to make sure that uh, we do this as regularly as possible until we know that we have overwhelmingly influenced guys to take the responsibility of sanitation. The state government also feels something must be done. The exercise will be a monthly affair. We were here about uh, two months ago. The situation was so ugly, more so that the workers were on strike. There was all, everywhere was littered with debt. These individuals got up on their own while this government was not in place and started cleaning. And so we have come to identify with them. We have come to encourage them. We have come to be part of it. And by the grace of God, we are going to take it as a policy in Kogi State. It shouldn't even be a one day in a month thing. Every morning you wake up, clean your environment. It is not for the good of government. It is for your own good. We, we all did um, elementary science and health science at mosquito breeds in that environment. That's basic. And if your environment is devoid of um, um, stagnant water bodies, you would save your family, your children from this malaria scourge, from typhoid, from Lassa fever. Kogi State is a destination with great tourism potential. And aside from the obvious health benefits of a clean environment, the proactive measure will be an open invitation to appreciate her vast resources. Now to the arts, Asho Igbar Social Fabric is an exhibition by Kelani Abbas at the Arts Clip Gallery in Lagos. This artist explores the beauty of traditional fabric using about 10 works of art and encourages Nigerians to take pride in wearing it. Our review tonight takes a look at how he sees the saparel. It's more than a cloth, but a big part of Nigeria's history. Kilani Abbas is not a new kid on the block, but an inspiration to a lot of aspiring artists. A lot of years has gone by since a national art competition shot him into limelight, and now there's no stopping him. Paradigm Shift in 2009, Man and Machine in 2011, Asiku in 2013, just to mention a few of his solo exhibitions that tells you this young man isn't ready to be brushed aside soon. For his next project, the life of the everyday people catches his fancy. It's seen in social fabric in which works done with pastel seek to understand the different strata in the society. Asho Igba Social Fabrics is actually inspired by a particular leaves uh, called parsley. I realized that parsley leaves is um, inspired uh, the damask fabric in which um, we use in most of the parts of Africa and Nigeria here. What makes them tick? Is it their ethnicity, wealth, values, interest, capacities? Pray tell. Actually, um, it's let's us see a culture, a tradition, and how important a fabric is to us and to people that wear them. The subjects in these drawings are broad and layered on a toned paisley leaf, while exploring personal stories that take the viewer down memory lane. I'll start from uh, a painting called Asho Odu. You know, festive periods is when people use fabrics a lot, especially children. 
uh, their RP that uh, the parent can actually get them what to wear for doing. And uh, in the painting, there's a particular boy uh, in uh, his Ankara designs. Not happy because after the fabric, he is expecting uh, more than the fabric, which is the food. He has over 20 works of art that he hopes will play up these stories that makes time stand still. It is to take most of us back to our old fabrics in which some of us have experienced uh, the views in the past and to see how important they are in our history and to see that uh, at a particular period and in our history, uh, some fabrics are available to us. And again, other ones will come and others will go. His path has not always been laced with gold since graduating with a distinction in painting from the Yaba College of Technology, Lagos. One can tell just by looking at his works that he knows what it takes to work his way to the top. And the brains behind the Art Clip Gallery insist that they are willing to provide a platform where emerging artists in the contemporary African art scene can be encouraged to make their good better and their better best. The Minister of Agriculture, Audu Obe, is blaming the spate of clashes involving herdsmen and residents of affected communities in the country on the neglect of pastoral farming by, by past administrations. The minister said the cows are hungry, so the herdsmen tend to throw caution to the wind during grazing periods. The minister, however, promised that the government is looking towards a permanent solution to the problem, as relief materials are also being put together for victims of the invasion. We need cows. We need meat. We need milk. We will need their bones and their horns for industrial and agricultural use. But since we haven't done much to care for them, they now wander around into farms and eat people's crops. Now, in the more extreme cases, like the Agatu case recently, there's a Fadama stretching, stretching nearly 40 kilometers, lush green grass by the bank of the river Benue. And it appears that they want to seize it as a permanent grazing area. So they come with a degree of violence that's simply outrageous. But we have found also and most of them are not Nigerian Fulanese. And my fears have been confirmed also by my colleague, my counterpart in the Congo, Minister of Agric, who told me they also come down from the Chad to the Congo. And to further confirm this, Kassina State and Zamfara have suffered as much in the hands of these headsmen as Benue or Enugu or Ogun or Oyo. They come down with AK-47s. They come down with such ferocity that it's like, if you stand in our way, we'll kill you. We want to feed our cows. We don't care what you planted, and so on. Now, that's the position. Uh, I have discussed the matter with Mr. President. He has instructed the military and the police to take action. But the long-term solution is in growing grass for cows. Uh, the ministry is trying to see what he can do to keep supporting people who are displaced. We're looking at the, at the, the uh, grain reserve to find food and send to them wherever they are because that's our business. Still ahead of the news at 10, uh, former U.S. Uh, First Lady Nancy Reagan dies at the age of 94. Please join us again.